happening? I was actually, you know, when you said Covenant House, I didn't know if I was going to tell the story or not. But three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was taking care of a young woman. It was just kind of a routine intake at Covenant House. And it was this lovely woman dressed in Islamic garb. And she had this bright smile on her face. And she talked about how much she wished to take care of children. Um, because when she, uh, her dream was to first run a daycare center. And then after she ran a daycare center to kind of build up her credentials until she was a pediatrician. And uh, she was talking about her love for children. And we talked, and I celebrated that love. And because so many of the kids who I care for are kids who are completely committed to healing the world. And uh, we celebrated that love. And she said, you know, I have this one concern. She said, here I am, ready to take care of kids. But I don't remember my childhood. I don't really remember anything. Well, I do remember some things. I remember getting thrown down the stairs. And I remember looking in the casket and seeing my daddy. I remember that, but you know, I don't remember having little shoes or anything. I don't remember getting hugged, and I don't remember any trips to Disney World. Is it okay if I don't remember my childhood? Our kids are not broken. Today, don't expect a single p-value from me. What we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna focus on how we look at kids not only in terms of how we view kids, but the forces within us that flavor or create the situation about how we convey how we view kids. Because those forces get in the way of the only thing that really heals, and that is love. And if we are not able to look at ourselves with self-reflection, understanding how if we begin seeing kids, not in terms of what they're doing right and how they can contribute to the world, but in terms only of what happened to them, then we become part of the problem. So we are going to be talking today about resilience. So let's begin. So let's begin by thinking, how is it that we're going to define success in childhood? And the first thing we have to think about is what we're really doing. When we are raising children, whether we're parents or doctors or nurses or teachers, when we are raising children, we have to remember what we're really doing. What we are doing is not paying attention to the eight-year-old in front of us or the 14-year-old in front of us. What we are doing is raising a 35-year-old. That's what we're doing. We're raising a 40-year-old who's ready to take over our world. And that is so critical for us to think about. Because when we do think about that, and then we can begin, just begin to think about the traits that we need in human beings. We need kids who are going to be happy. But what does happiness mean? It's not the same as looking at an eight-year-old. In an eight-year-old, you hand them a cookie, and they're happy. <laughs> happiness in adulthood is about being content. It's about being content with the contribution that you are making into the world. Then we need kids to be committed to repairing the world, tikkun olam, to be committed to making a difference. What does that mean? We need kids who are compassionate, who are generous of spirit, and who are empathetic. We need kids who are going to be hardworking, who are going to have grit, who are going to have tenacity. When someone else looks at them and for any reason looks at them and suggests, you can't do that, that makes them just want to fight harder. We need kids who are creative and who are innovative because all the best ideas, they haven't been thought of yet. We need kids who have collaborative skills, who can get along with other human beings, and who um, uh, also have leadership skills, meaning that they can really take an idea, bring it to the next level, and who can take constructive criticism, who see constructive criticism as an opportunity for growth, not as something that shuts them down. And we need kids who are resilient, because as much as we would love to wrap kids in protective quilts, as much as we would like to protect them from every adversity that will ever strike them, number one, it's not possible. Number two, I'm not sure it's even good for them. Because when we are looking for um, the truth, which is kids who are going to be generous, who are going to be compassionate, who are going to be empathetic, we need kids. I mean, where do you get that from? On some level, you get that from the pain that you need to endure. So I am not saying that we shouldn't fight with every bit of our energy those adverse childhood experiences you've been talking about. But I am saying that we shouldn't wrap our kids in bubble wrap either. So 
when we talk about resilience, what are we talking about? We're talking about the ability to overcome adversity and the capacity to bounce back. We start with understanding that it's a mindset. When something bad happens to you, do you see it as a catastrophe or do you see it as an opportunity? When we think about resilience, we have to understand that it is our reaction to stress. And we have to understand that stress is something that is hardwired into us. Why? Because we are meat, right? We are meat, we are prey, and it is about being able to transform our bodies instantly so that we can escape from a tiger. And so one of the first parts of the mindset of resilience is being able to look at a situation and say, is this a real tiger or a paper tiger? With the bottom line being, if it can't chew your face off, it's not a real tiger. <laughs> resilience is not invulnerability. I could move into your house, I could raise your kids, I've raised my own, and I could not create kids who could handle every situation in every circumstance. I could not, nor would I want to for the reason I said. Each of us has a story. I don't think there's anyone in this room who's randomly devoting their life to healing children. I don't believe it. If you look at me, it's 17. 17 was a year where I almost killed myself, but never really tried, but thought about it every day. The worst year of my life. Would I ever, ever, want to go through anything like that again? No. But you know what it gave me? My life, my purpose, my sense of mission. Resilience is not invulnerability. Resilience is not a temperament trait, right? You know a kid's temperament when they're two years old. You know whether they're the kind of kid, you know how they're gonna do in their college interview, right? Are they the kind of kid who's gonna be in the middle of the room going like, hey, look at me? Or are they gonna be the kind of kid who's gonna be behind you? We know their temperament early on. Resilience is not that. Resilience is about the supports and circumstances that we put into kids' lives. It is about us. I could summarize 60 years of research on resilience um, while standing on one foot. Here is what we know. We know that the kids who make it, despite difficult times, are the people who have at least one adult who believe in them unconditionally and who hold them to high expectations. Who should that adult be? Ideally, that's parents, but guess what? It's people like us, too. It's aunts and uncles and coaches and, 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 and priests and rabbis and, and, and uh, social workers and doctors. This is who it is. And who believes in someone unconditionally. What does that mean? Does that mean, like, dude, it's OK to do drugs? Is that unconditional belief? No, it's I'm not going anywhere. I have your back and who hold you to high expectations. Is that about grade? Is that about performance? No. It is that someone absolutely knows who you are. Someone absolutely believes in you with full knowledge of who you are. For my own girls who are 17 years old and when they wear high heels are now taller than me, okay? So for my own girls, you know who they are? They're 17, so right, you can imagine we have our moments. But let me tell you who they are. They're the little girls who, when we were on a trip to Belize once, they saw um, a chicken hanging out of a pot with um, legs sticking out. And they said to me, one of them said to me, Abby, did you know that when people eat chickens, they're eating real chickens? Why would they do that? Don't they like chickens? <laughs> they wouldn't let us kill bugs. They wouldn't let us turn off the lights during the summertime. Why? Because the moths were, were happy flying around the lights. And if we turned off the lights, where would they go? We had to go to Home Depot, honestly, and buy a tractor beam flashlight to walk the moths outside to be with their moth grandmas. That is how delicious my girls are. And during the worst of times, there is someone who believes in them intensely and holds them to that level and that depth of character. That is what high expectations is. Because the other thing that we know is the kids live up or down to your expectations of them. Don't you know that that's true? Don't you know it? In the home, in school, everywhere. It's about living up or down to your expectations. That's everything you need to know about resilience. Truly, the rest is commentary. I could be done now, but I'm not, all right? So, what else do we know? We know, let's talk about the youth development movement and the literature that we know from the youth development movement. The first thing we know is that we matter. It's about the people. People come for the um, basketball court. People come for the computers. They don't come for the tutoring. They'll do that after you get them, okay? But what really makes a difference in whether a program is gonna make a difference in youth is about us. We, the people, matter more. Kids come for the content, but the context is what heals. Next, young people need to feel valued. 
When we see them as the experts in their own lives, they learn that they matter. They learn that their opinions matter. Next, youth are often the very best teachers for youth. All right, we know this. There's good research on this, and it's common sense. There's no one more powerful than kids to teach other kids. Adults can be constructive and supportive, but when we dive in and say, let me do this for you, there's nothing more disempowering. What do kids hear when they say, oh, you knocked over your blocks, let me help you? I don't think you can. Um, adolescents, this is really important to me. This isn't a core principle of youth development, but it is a core principle of my life. Adolescents, believe me, are still capable of healing. And one of the things that I worry about whenever we think about um, you know, primary, primary prevention is we're always thinking about children, and God forbid, we would forget how capable of healing adolescents are because that is my life work and I get to see it. Um, next, almost everything that we fear in adolescence, almost all the behaviors that we fear, whether it's um, cutting or eating disorders or bullying or violence or gaming or sex out of the context of a, a good relationship or drugs or alcohol, almost everything that we fear is about kids reacting to a world that feels stressful to them and telling them what not to do doesn't work. It's shaming and it's disempowering. Instead, we have to welcome them and invite them in a healing process to come up with other ways of coping. This is a model that um, I created for the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's now used by many national organizations. It is masterfully stolen from the, um, the youth development movement, okay, and kind of put together. The first thing we need is confidence. If we're going to have a kid who's going to be resilient, the first thing we need is to have a kid who believes that they can. Now, we had the answer to confidence years ago. We developed a self-esteem movement. Do you remember that? We made every kid feel special just for burping, right? Everyone got an award. Every kid felt as special as a butterfly and as unique as a snowflake. Seriously. We had kindergarten curriculum where you would cut out snowflakes, they'd put them on the walls, and they'd say, kids, each of you, you're as unique as a snowflake, right? Did that, what happened when those kids got to college? They fell apart. They were a mess. Why? Do you ever have those moments where you just don't feel special as a butterfly? You have those? Real confidence comes from confidence. Real confidence comes from knowing that you are doing something well and not having people undermine your confidence. I'm giving an evening talk tonight. We're going to cover that pretty intensely. Not having people undermine your confidence. All right? Next, connection, because the bottom line is that when someone has my back, I feel more secure. But up till now, you've got a gang member. Check it out. Gang members, really confident. I'm highly competent and deeply connected. It's character. Having an understanding of what is right and wrong, having grit, having tenacity. And we undermine people's character when we say, gosh, you've been through so much. I hold you to lower expectations. That doesn't help, all right? Contribution. Having a sense that, um, that you are going to make a difference in the world. So, um, you know, the ultimate act of resilience, the ultimate act of resilience in the worst of times is to turn to another human being and to say, brother, I need a hand. That's it. That's your ultimate act. What is it that's going to allow you to do that without shame or stigma? It is the experience of service, right? When you give, you learn to feel good. You learn that people, um, that it feels good. And what that means is that when you need to take, which all of us will need to do at some time, we can do that without shame and without stigma. But it's more than that. When you give, you are surrounded by thank yous. And for all teenagers who are held to low expectations, being surrounded by thank yous matters. For our racially oppressed minority kids who receive messages that they are less than or not good enough everywhere, being surrounded by gratitude, by thank yous instead of condemnation is profoundly, profoundly important. Next. Coping. We already talked about coping. We talked about the fact that telling kids what not to do is not going to make a difference. What is going to make a difference is sharing with them good alternatives of what to do. And finally, control. You either believe that the world happens to you or you believe that the choices you make can make a difference. For kids who have been abused, more than anything, perhaps, is this sense that there is no control. You don't even have control over safety over your own body, perhaps. The world happens to me. Dr. Ken, when my time comes, my, your time comes. That's how I'm going to live fast. Die young, maybe, but I'm going to take care of what I need to do right now. Those are people without a sense of control. 
this afternoon is going to be about brief interventions that address some of these Cs. Right now, we're going to be really continuing to talk more about the philosophy. So, being trauma-informed is healing because as I heard someone say, you know, and as I learned from Sandy Bloom, when I can look at a human being through a different lens and instead of saying what's wrong with you to be able to say what happened to you, it changes everything, everything. But focusing on trauma or risk possibly, possibly holds the potential to re-traumatize. So because kids live up or down to our expectations, it means that our attitude really, really matters. They read us. They know what we expect. They know whether or not we perceive them to be broken. And kids judge our attitude very, very easily. So Karen Pittman, someone who's been a role model for me in the youth development movement, her line is problem free, is not fully prepared. In general, when we look at kids, particularly poor kids, we seem to be satisfied when they don't. If you're not doing drugs, not in a gang, and not getting pregnant, we're celebrating. That's not good enough for my kids. That's not good enough for anybody's kids. We have to have a completely different mindset that says that every kid, all kids, should be prepared to lead us into the future, to be fully prepared. We have to remember the importance of discipline to kids to giving them a sense of control. We have to understand what adolescence is. Adolescence is about trying to uh, answer one fundamental question, which is what? What's the question of adolescence? Who am I? That's the question. Who am I? So think of it as a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Someone puts it on your table, right? And says, here, you've got four years to put together this puzzle to figure out who you are. Where do you begin? How do you begin putting it together? The edges. You put together the edges. Those boundaries are what discipline is about. Good discipline is about being able to have someone say, I am going to keep you safe because I value your safety. Here are the edges. Everything in the middle, you can put together the pieces. You can shove them together. You have lots of flexibility, lots of opportunity for growth, lots of opportunity to test your wings. But the edges, those are clear because I love you so intensely that I keep you safe. And then what's the next thing you do? How do you then begin to put together the puzzle? What's the next thing you do? You, you put together the whole borders, power of discipline, and then you look at the picture in the box. You cheat, right? You say, hey, what is this supposed to look like? That is the power of role modeling. Because we are the covers on the box. And when you have a parent at home who gives you appropriate edges, and who shows you what the picture in the box is supposed to look like, you're ready for normal, healthy development. And when you lack that, how do you begin to put together the puzzle? So for those of us who heal youth, for kids who haven't had appropriate boundaries, boundaries become even that much more important. If you come to Covenant House, one of our core principles is structure. We have all sorts of rules. The kids hate them and they absolutely cherish them. Because it says, someone is watching out for me. Next, we have to have high standards. We cannot say, well, this kid's been through so much. Of course, that kid needs extra support, extra adults in their lives to teach them, people who will take them on no matter what people who will become their godfather or their big brother. We need those people in their lives without a, standard, without a shadow of a doubt, those extra supports, those programs. But when we begin holding kids to different standards because they've been through that, we perpetuate the cycle of oppression and tragedy, and we affect their character. How do we portray youth in general as a society? Are we portraying youth at risk? Right? Here is uh, Rudyard, Montana. 596 nice people, one old sore head. <laughs> Anderson Cooper comes to town. What is the uh, headline? Does Anderson Cooper walk around town and say, like, can I meet some of your nice people? Right? What is Anderson Cooper looking for? 
you know, where is your sore head? I heard there was a sore head in, in, in town uh, traumatizing your, your community. Three years ago in the city of Philadelphia, you could have thought that any time three black kids caught together, you were having a flash mob. You could have really believed that because we set people up to look for the problems. Why is, so Anderson, um, the, the Today Show calls and they ask me to be on the Today Show. And Matt Lauer says, so Ken, Dr. Ken, I want you to know that 37% of 10th graders, I'm making up these numbers entirely, okay? 37% of 10th graders are having sex. Crisis in America. How did this happen? What should my answer be? What should my answer be? How would you respond? Thank you, Matt, for the opportunity to celebrate youth. You know, <laughs> it is such good news that we have so many kids who, despite all the influences on society, uh, from society, are doing the right thing. Thank you for this opportunity. Why? Because developmentally, kids are trying to figure out who they are, right? And they are, you know, the corollary question of who am I is am I normal? And they are looking everywhere for clues that say whether or not they are normal. And those clues, they are not hearing the 37%. They're hearing, hey, you know what gets attention? At this point, I do a lot of military work. And I was at Fort Sill um, about a year ago. And at this point, a father raised his hand. Um, and he said, you know, my 12-year-old son last week had a conversation with me. He said, Daddy, you know, um, I'm going to be a teenager soon. And I hear that um, teens are really, really um, difficult and cause a lot of problems for their parents. And they're really moody. You know, I'd really rather not cause a lot of problems. And I really don't want to be moody. Is that OK? <laughs> so from a developmental perspective, when kids are trying to figure out what normal is, this is a disaster when we harp on what is wrong. From a resilience perspective, when we understand that kids live up or down to our expectations, we begin to understand the real tragedy that we are producing. Kids, are they problems to be solved, or are they problem solvers? It's more than the words we say. It's not about slogans. It's not about being on the Today Show and changing the paradigm. It's more than the words we say. It's what we convey. It's what we convey when we sit with a human being. Do we pity? Are we paternalistic? Or are we listening totally for the strength of the human being to bring it out? First thing you need to do to be able to take care of traumatized people, or in fact, any teenager at all, is to know where your buttons are. Because you know what? As I said, Every one of us has a path that had us come in this room, right? You could have gone into business, all right? So all of us have a path. And if you're not, the business is bad if they give money away. So the point is that, um, the point is that you have to know what your buttons are. Because if you don't know them, when a kid comes in and they push them, you are not going to be therapeutic. And you are going to convey messages that are not going to be helpful to that kid. Right? Because your buttons were installed during adolescence. So if a kid walks in and they look like someone who bullied you, you're not going to treat them very well. In the perfect world, I would spend you know, a couple days here. Mostly, for those of you who don't, don't know me, I do 8 to 16 hour trainings. So it is torture that Martha asked me to do this in 45. Okay. <laughs> But the point is, if we were really training you, we would ask you to look at yourself. So, so since I can't do that, let's, let's, do, let's do me. So I reached puberty when I was 16 years old, or uh, almost 16. I was like 16 the next Tuesday, right? And um, so, uh, so as a result, who am I? I am the boy who in eighth grade looked like I was nine years old. And I lucked out because I was adorable. And so all of the ninth grade girls, or excuse me, the eighth grade girls, remember how you were um, uh, making maps of like the partition of Louisiana territory and stuff? There was a map of my naked body called um, the partition of Little Doll Territory. And, it, and as I would walk down the hallways, the girls that owned that piece of me would grab it. It was great, <laughs> all right? But what it means is that I am stuck. I am stuck. And it means that there are certain kinds of kids, and I could tell you story after story, but in the interest of time, we're going to leave that one. All right? I am stuck in that area. So what happens when I see a 14-year-old girl comes into my office, and she's beautiful? What do I want from her? What? 
I want her to like me. Let's get a little bit cruder. What do I really want? I want her to think I'm sexy. Because like cute I had down, nice I had down, what I never had was sexy. Do you understand how sick that is? <laughs> Do you understand how potentially dangerous that is for me to have an interaction with this kid and to want something from her? That's one of many buttons I have. If you don't know your own buttons, then kids will push them and you will not be able to have a therapeutic relationship to them because their pain, their adversity, will bring up your own stuff. And on some level, you will ask for healing from them, which will disempower your capacity to give the love that they need. Body language. But it's all about body language. I work with the toughest kids in Philly um, who are the biggest doll babies, as any of you um, who work with this population would know. But it's all about body language. For marginalized kids especially, um, let's think about, when I say marginalized kids, what groups of kids do you look at and based on their external appearance, you know them. You make decisions about who they are. Name for me groups. Gangs, for sure. Um, bulimics. You don't necessarily see a bulimic, but you do see an anorexic, and you're going to make decisions about them. Obese kids. Poor kids in general. Kids in wheelchairs. Gender atypical gay kids, right? You make judgments about them. Arabs, what else? Multiply tattooed, actually. The, the kid with the, like the um, razor blade in their cheek and their purple hair mohawk, right? If you ask them what is it that bothers them about people, what they say is like, people are always looking at me, man. <laughs> and you're like, dude, right? Um, so, um, and all oppressed racial minority groups. So I am driving in the streets of North Philadelphia in a primarily Latino neighborhood, and say my little girls are in the back seat, and I stop at a corner, and there is uh, someone with a paper bag drinking. What do I do? I lock the doors, they hear the sounds. I am walking on the streets of Philadelphia, and it's 45 degrees out, and there's a young black man walking with a hoodie. What do I do? I cross the street, I check my wallet. Like the air he breathes, like the air he breathes, he learns that people hold him to low expectation. And that is poison. Poison to someone's self-image. Poison to someone's belief about who they are. And how does he absorb it? He absorbs it through my body language. Now let's talk about power. Now before I wasn't talking about me really because I don't cross the street. But now, although, does that mean that I am free of any racist attitude? How could I have grown up in America and say that I was and be honest with myself? Okay? So um, let's now talk about power. Now we are talking about me. Name the ways in which I, Ken Ginsburg, have power. I am male. White would depend on how you would define white. What else? I'm a doctor, so I am highly educated. That's 28 years of school. It's the only power I've earned. I kind of like it, even if I was forced into it. Um, but enough about that. Um, so um, what, what else? What? Upper middle class. I'm actually, if we can say it, rich. Right? My problems, my problems are things like, will I have enough money saved for college? Can I go on a vacation this year? And is it to the Caribbean or Europe? What can I afford? Those are my problems. I'm rich. OK, what else? Uh, <laughs> uh, what else? You're highly articulate. Thank you. Thank you. And quite good looking. Um, so yeah, humble. Yeah. So the point is that I have power. As a wealthy white man, I have power. And you know something? I like it. I like having power. Power is something every single human being should feel because it gives you a sense of control. Power is something every single human being deserves. Now let's talk about the young black man on the street. Where does he get power from? Is he likely to get the message from society that says, I am investing very heavily in your education and I expect you to lead us into the future? Is that likely his message? 
despite having an African-American president? Is that likely the message he's getting? I think not. Where does he get power from vis-a-vis -vis me, the man who really has the power? Let's be honest. Possibly a weapon, but absolutely for my fear. When I cross the street, when I clutch my pocket, I communicate I am afraid to you. And when he is 12 years old, and he has just transformed from being cute into being someone who makes people cross the street, he is devastated. And when he is 14, he is confused. And when he is 16, he is angry. And what he learns is that the way to draw power back from the man who has taken the power is to use the power that you have, which is the power of fear. So how do we break this? And that is what the attitude is. If you look at any one of the marginalized groups that I talked about, what they all have in common is an attitude. An attitude is a defensive posture that says, I have been hurt by people like you, and I will not set myself up for that pain again. It is a defensive posture. And how do we change that um, uh, attitude? We say things like, you won't have that kind of attitude with me. Not so good. How do we break that attitude? with love, with love and with respect, which is really what we're talking about today. And it begins with our body language. When we do, this does not say I'm a racist who fears you. It really doesn't. I might be cold, I might be uncomfortable, but it also doesn't say I'm not. When we pay attention to our body language, when we make ourselves open, when we welcome people heartily and we don't start with what's wrong with you, but we say, what's the thing you're proudest of in your life? Tell me what's happened since the last time I've seen you. Make me proud, give me goosebumps. When we do that with open arms and we don't turn our backs by looking at the dang computer in our medical record system, okay, then we convey another issue of mine. Um, but uh, then we convey that we have the potential to love. Now let's talk about behavioral change. So I'm not very bright. So what I do is take a whole bunch of theories that I can't understand because they have really big words in it, and then kind of condense them down. But as I see it, behavioral change, if you take all the behavioral change theories in the world, what they really say is, hey, there's about five steps to behavioral change. The first thing that we need to do is be aware of a problem. Because if you're not aware of a problem, you're certainly not going to take action. After you're aware of a problem, you have to be personally motivated to want to do something about the problem. Because if you're not personally motivated, you're not going to do something. As long as the problem belongs to other people, I'm not taking action, right? We know this from early HIV epidemic, right? HIV, we were all terrified until we learned that it was only gay white men. And then as soon as we knew that, we all went back to our old behaviors. Right? You have to be personally motivated. Once you're personally motivated, the question is, do we have any skills to be able to do something about the issue? If you have the skills, then you go through a process of going through the trial and error. What have I given up? What have I gained? Right? And if, um, uh, so I want to quit smoking cigarettes, and that's good. Because when she kisses me, I'm not going to go like, or she's not going to go, ooh, and my teeth aren't going to be yellow, and I'm going to save $8 a day. But damn, I'm nervous. That kid ready to quit? Not until you give them coping strategies to replace that which they um, were using previously. Not until you do that. And then finally, will I maintain the new behavior or will I not maintain the new behavior? And what's that about? That is about how what people will undermine versus support my new behaviors. Right? That is where it gets back to that Rudyard Montana thing. What is the messages we are going to portray about kids? What are our expectations of kids? I want to be a virgin until I marry. How do people respond? Do people say, Ken, I'm so, strong, I'm so proud of your spiritual and religious center? Or do they go, what's wrong with you, man? Right? That's what maintenance is about. So this is all the behavioral change theories in a nutshell, as I simplistically see them. And they're all missing something. What they're missing is that confidence gets it started and shame paralyzes all efforts. And when we sit with a human being, starting with their brokenness, starting with what is wrong with them, we bring shame to their lives. In adolescent medicine, I was taught to remember two numbers. My mentors told me probably the first day, I want you to think of two numbers, and I want you to think of them every single time you see a teenager. The first number is the 80% of what kills kids doesn't need to happen. 50% of kids who do, do kill themselves see a doctor in the previous month. 
25% in the previous week. And so for these reasons, I was to sit with human beings and I was to think about what was wrong with them, to get the history of their brokenness so that I could come back with three or four answers very simplistically of why they should change. Does that work? No, it's intrinsically shameful and people shut down. And the last thing marginalized and traumatized and reactive kids need is one more person saying, let me tell you what's wrong with you. So what do we need to do? We need to look at people differently. We need to find their, um, build their confidence. How? By finding their competencies. Here is the field of a kid's life. This kid's using drugs. Shame on you. That's incredibly self-destructive behavior. This kid is selling drugs, which is destructive not only to society, not only to himself, but to society. And this kid wants to become pregnant. She's 14 years old. And what do we do? In all of our wisdom, we say to the kid, stop that. Let me give you four to five reasons so that you can understand what you're doing is fundamentally wrong. Inspired? Ready to change? So let's look at the young man who's using drugs. Don't you know the marijuana will fry your brain, shrink your balls, and make you grow breasts? All of which is essentially, with a little bit of poetic license, true, all right? But what do you do? You say that to a kid, what do they say? Thanks, doc. And then they're smoking again. Why? Because you've stressed them out. They've got to deal with the problem. So my favorite kids, what do we know? The kid who uses drugs, what does that kid possess? These are my favorite kids. No one hates drugs more than I do, I guarantee you. But they're my favorite kids, why? Why can you imagine that they're my favorite kids? Taking they're taking action to deal with what? Stress. stress, and they are feeling the stress. There's so many ways of dealing with pain, right? You can starve it out, you can fight it out, you can sex it out, you can cut it out. There's so many ways of dealing with pain. The kids who are doing drugs are doing what? They're trying to become numb. What kind of human beings are trying to become numb? Those with feelings. So my intervention with that young man is going to be, man, do you ever feel like your head is just spinning? Do you ever feel like you wish you could fix things at home, you know, and you wish you could fix things at school? And people are always saying, like, you don't care about things, but that's because they don't know you. They don't know you. Do you ever feel like you just wish you could do it all, but you can't, but at least once, once a day, twice a day, you just, and your feelings get better? And then they go, exactly. And now I have started from their point of strength, from their point of power. And now I can say, a man like you, a man like you with your sensitivity, you're the kind of man who we need to be able to take over my world. And we build. The kid who's using gangs, I hate gangs. And if I was on the street, I would never stop and say, hello, I'm from Covenant House. May I join your little circle? Not happening. But in my office, these are the kids with the highest levels of loyalty. Once you reach them, these kids will stick with you forever. All they were looking for was connection and safety. Right? And the kid who wants to become pregnant, what does she want to be? She wants to be loved. When we talk about pregnancy prevention, we make it sound like a disease. We should celebrate their desire to love, their capacity to want to make the world better for another generation, perhaps because they didn't see it. And we should talk instead of delaying the celebration, not preventing pregnancy. And then what we do is we overtake the field of risk. So for those of us who are a resilience-based interventionists, we are not blind to risk at all. We do this because of risk. We understand the trauma that created it, but what we do instead in a loving way is we sit with the human being and we say, how can we move forward? There are many examples. This is an 18-year-old boy. This is a white kid who grew up in um, Harlem, Spanish Harlem. And uh, he comes to see me on a Friday. Um, he came in uh, the night or two nights before. He's presented to me by a medical student. The medical student says, um, uh, uh, Ken, you have to go see this kid. There's something wrong. I won't be able to sit because you guys won't see me, but he's kind of sitting like this. Like he, the kid wasn't talking to the med student. He's sitting like this. What is this the look of? This is shame. So I set the stage with him and talked about why it would be safe to talk and why I might maybe be worthy of his trust. And then I asked him if he wanted to tell me a story. And then he said to me, 
you know, I got kicked out of my mom's house eight months ago. Do you ask them why? No, because kids are like onions. So you do one layer at a time. And, you, um, and he said, you know, I got kicked out of my mom's house eight months ago. I went down to Port Authority or Times Square to figure out how to live. And you know, I um, ate out of trash cans for about three weeks. Slept on the subways, you know, always during the day because if you uh, sleep there during night, they roll you. Learn to sit next to the college students, you know, because they, um, uh, they would always like leave me a sandwich or something. So I was in the square. You know, I forgot to tell you, this is one of the best looking kids I've ever seen in my whole life. Like Abercrombie and Fitch material, dead, dead straight, all right? Um, so, you know, I was down in the uh, Times Square one day eating out of a trash can, and this guy came up to me, and he said to me, you know, if you, uh, if you begin dealing with me, you're going to have everything you ever want, a feast every night, all the girls you'd ever want, your own place, everything. You know, I didn't want to do it, man. You know, my mom was an addict. I remember be being three years old and watching smoke come out of her nose and then seeing this smile come across her face and I'd be asking myself, why can't I make my mom happy like that? She had visitors every day, 10, 20 visitors. We just had one room. And there was just a sheet in the middle of the room and I'd have to face the wall while they'd be groaning and she'd be screaming and I would be sitting there thinking, how can she love those men more than she loves me? And you know, I didn't want to do that to any other little kid, you know? But I was so hungry, and I don't know if you've ever been that hungry. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. So I began dealing. You know, he was right. That night I had a feast, and I had as much as I ever wanted every night. I got my own place with like a lock, like a, my own door with one of those locks you can't even move things. And I had all the girls I ever wanted. Yeah, it was scary. What do you do? You just go like this, and people almost always back off. Yeah, I had to shoot at people a couple times, but always over their head, you know, because I never wanted them to, I never wanted to really hurt anybody. Um, so uh, what happened? Yeah, so I was walking on the street, and I saw this girl, and I never sold her anything. You know, maybe she was like 26, 27 years old. I never saw her anything, but she was just laying there. And the effing suits, you know, they're walking by her, like she's trash or something. And I went up to her and I smashed her face around. I was like, you got to breathe. And I'm not proud of this or anything, but I called 911, you know? And then when they came, I ran. I ran. But I went to the corner and I watched. I watched as they put something on her face. I watched as they pumped on her chest. And then I watched as the effing suits were gathered around in a circle, you know? They thought it was like really interesting. And they like, they were like calling their wives, like, hey, I'm watching some kid die, you know? And I watched as she died. But do you know what I saw? I saw me. Maybe in like a month, maybe in a year. But I saw me dying. And the effing suits walking by like I was absolutely nothing. And you know what? I don't think I am trash. I really don't. And I had like just $14 in my pocket, you know, and I went down to Port Authority and I, and I bought a ticket and I just said, where? And they said, Philly. So I guess I'm your problem now, huh, Dr. Ken? So I said to him, you were an addict and you were a dealer and you carried weapons? Shame on you. <laughs> what do you love about this kid? All that, all that. What I said exactly was, tell me something. Tell me how all the effing suits don't have a soul, and you're the man who's been through it all, and you're the only man with a soul. Teach me about you. Teach me about your compassion and where, how you kept it. Because if I learn that about you, I swear I will be a better man myself. And he wept, and he became my puppy dog. And that is all that I do. All that I do is I listen for the stories that nobody else hears. I listen with different parts of my body because what happens as we get further in our training is we have models and paradigms about how we are going to heal. And when we do that, we get stuck in our heads. It becomes about us and the next course of action that we are going to take. 
And as a result, we lose what our viscera tells us. What part of your body tells you that you love? Like it really feels something. Your stomach, well, let's go with that. Um, your heart, right? Think about it. Like, you know, you naturally grasp it. God, I love him. Valentine's Day. I had a broken heart. When you really love him, when you really care, you actually feel something. Get out of your head and into your body. What part of your body says that you're worried about someone? That's your stomach. It was like he kicked me in the gut. I don't know. I feel kind of sick. I'm blessed with goosebumps. So that when I feel like my, like, and I show kids all the time, they're like, dude, all right? <laughs> but the choreograph that I try to follow is, goes something like this. I love you, I love you, I love you. And how do I express my love? By telling them back the story. So I say very little as I listen, but I wait until my heart is going, God, I want this kid to make it. This kid deserves better. This kid surprises me. They shocked me. Why does this kid have compassion despite the fact that he was shown none? How is this kid resilient in a world that would have killed me? These are the things you're looking for. And when you feel that, that is what I mean by love. And when you then can go back, and love shouldn't scare us. It scares us because we speak English. So if I say, Dan, I love you, there's a potential problem because it could involve genitals. But if we spoke other languages, <laughs> if we spoke other languages, right, then what would happen is that we would be saying in Hebrew, we'd be saying chesed, love of humanity, Arabic, mahaba, love of humanity, agape in Christianity. There's so many different words that we shouldn't be afraid of the fact that we have love for humanity. And what we are conveying basically is, um, without using any of the words or the body language, okay, I love you, I love you, I love you. Pause, deep breath, but I'm feeling worried about you. May we come up with a solution? How can I serve you? Heart, stomach, head, hands. You listen with your body until you see the beauty of the kid in front of you and why you want them desperately to succeed, why you know that they should succeed, especially because of what they've been through and what they bring to the world. And then there is no shame in the room. And then the behavioral change process can begin. If you speak to people who have been through very, very difficult times and you ask them what turned their lives around, it, the sentence you will always hear, go talk to 23-year-olds. It's always going to be something like, you know, it was when Miss Nadine made me understand I was not trash. It was when Miss Andy made me understand that there was something inside of me. That is the moment we're looking for, and that is what I call love. And let me tell you something else. This is also about burnout prevention. Did you see the choreograph I did? I love you, I love you, I love you. Pause, deep breath, but I'm feeling worried about you. It is a choreograph. Does that make it phony? No. Let me tell you something. I almost, uh, I wasn't intending to go into academic medicine, as Angelo can tell you. Um, uh, you know, I got a, a, a job out of residency to become the uh, homeless health director in uh, New York for Covenant House. It was the prime job if you were interested in homeless medicine. There it was, I was top of the world. No one else was competing. And I was, um, <laughs> Um, I was fabulous when I was 27, okay? Um, I looked like the kids. I looked like I was about 21. Remember, I reached puberty when I was 16. And the way in which I expressed love for kids was by telling them what I felt. I tapped a vein. I bled for every kid in front of me. I would have been amazing. For how long? Mm, maybe six months. You run out of blood. This kind of a choreograph, when all that I'm doing is listening to the kid's story and reflecting it back, I don't need to bleed. I need to listen and feel and then speak. And then I go home because there's something else that I know. Kids are the experts in their own lives. It is not for me to rescue. When I believe that it is for me to rescue, I actually undermine their sense of competence. When I understand that they are the experts in their own lives and it's for them to heal, but for another human being to have caught the reason and the legitimacy that they must heal so that they can lead us into the future, then I can go home with my family 
And I will do this for 20 more years because I know now what to do and I feel okay walking away as well. What are our bottom lines? We need to help youth know how much they matter. It is about listening to them. It is about celebrating them. It is about recognizing the credentials they bring to the world. You know, our kids are not broken. Let me tell you who my Covenant House kids are. These are the gang members. These are the kids who have been sexually exploited. These are the kids who are in and out of the system and in and out of the prison. Let me tell you who they want to be. They want to be the teachers, the DHS workers, the social workers, the doctors, the forensic psychologist. That's who all my kids want to be. They want to be healers. And they are magnificently equipped to do so. They come to the world with a different kind of credential. And when we pity them and see them as broken and feel like our job is to rescue them, we take away the power that they actually have and what they actually bring to the world. The question for us is will we intervene at the right time or will we give up? Because we know something else. We know that if we don't grab these kids in late adolescence and say, I do believe in you, I see in you, your potential and your beauty, and give them the opportunities, then hopelessness will set in. And then the cycle of poverty, injustice, and oppression continues. We have to do the work that it takes to love. When you come to me at Covenant House, what you do and, and you present to me, you have to present with, this is Roger. And what I love about him is, so for those of you who don't know medical presentations, it looks like this. This is a 16-year-old African-American female who's presenting with, okay? To Ken, you have to say, this is a 16-year-old who's presenting with, and the reason I love her is. Because when we do the hard work, and you can't say things like, I like her nails, <laughs> okay? You have to do the hard work of figuring out why this kid is so deserving of healing and of a positive future. You have to do that whole work because it will change your perspective on how you view humanity. And when that happens, what we convey will feel different, or completely different. For those of us who work with trauma repeatedly, we see things that therefore but the grace of God go our daughters, our mothers, our children, and ourselves. And it is overwhelming and it is terrifying and as a result for those of us in who see trauma all the time well forget trauma just think about when there is a mugging on the street what is the first thing you think about why well, don't walk on that side of the street I don't go out at 10 at night we all have mechanisms to make us think this could not happen to me this is about emotional survival in a world that is in fact unpredictable that's what it's about. When we work with trauma, what we do is we begin othering. We begin saying, this doesn't happen to people like me. And whether othering is about sexuality or poverty or race, we begin deciding why we are safe. And when we begin othering, when our solution to our pain begins placing blame on the person's group, we stop feeling. We shut down. Are we protected emotionally? In the short term. In the long term, we lose the capacity to love. And when we lose the capacity to love, we lose the capacity to heal. There is no other. There is only us. Thank you.